Books are the treasured wealth of the world and the fit inheritance of generations and nations. Books, the oldest and the best, stand naturally and rightfully on the shelves of every cottage. Huh. East of my bean field had once lived Cato Ingraham, slave of Duncan Ingraham. Cato's half obliterated cellar hole still remains, though known to few, being concealed from the traveler by a fringe of pines. I have learned that the swiftest traveler is he that goes afoot. Most men, even in this comparatively free country, through mere ignorance and mistake, are so occupied with the factitious cares and superfluously coarse labors of life that its finer fruits cannot be plucked by them. Down the road on Brister's Hill had once lived Brister Freeman, slave of Squire Cummings, and there grow still the apple trees which Brister planted and tended, large old trees now, but their fruits still wild and ciderish. All sound heard at the greatest possible distance produces one and the same effect, the vibration of the universal lyre, just as the intervening atmosphere makes a distant ridge of the earth interesting to our eyes by the azure tint it imparts to it.
interesting. I hardly know what you do with your time, Henry. The children say you took them out huckleberrying all day rather than working on those edits I suggested for your article. Sometimes I think I would like to see your work published more than you would. Dear Counselor, I write in assistance of a young friend of mine, Mr. Henry David Thoreau, who has taken time from his literary pursuits to invent a new, improved method for the production of pencils. I believe a patent application for this method would be successful, and the financial support from such a patent would be of great importance to this young man's family. Might you look at the drawings and specifications included and give us advice on how to make such an application. Sincerely, Ralph Waldo Emerson. Dear Emerson, I thank you for your kind words on the dial and for sending the piece by Mr. Thoreau. I do not see the full merits of the work as you have described, yet having some knowledge of the man, there is no objection I could make to his lines which I would not make to himself. He is rare, of open eye, ready hand, and noble scope. He sets no limits to his life, but is somewhat a bare hill, which the warm gales of spring have not yet visited. A wider and deeper human experience will mold the man and melt his verse. I can have no better advice for a person so sincere. Margaret Fuller Good afternoon. Hello. Ah, you found my Confucius. Good for you, Henry. I wanted to look at that passage about knowing what we know and what we don't know. I know you must know the what I mean. Yes, I've read it. Well, that's good. I'd hoped you would and that it would give you inspiration. Your experiment reminds me quite a bit of what Confucius says about needing only coarse rice for food, water to drink, and the bended arm for a pillow to achieve happiness. But since we're discussing these ethical scriptures, I've also been looking all over for my laws of Manu. I was reading it the other day over by the cleared area near Haywood's Peak. Have you seen it there by any chance? I haven't seen it, but I can look for it. Wonderful. Let me mark the very spot I think I left it on your map so that you can find it. That shouldn't be difficult to find. I'll see you again soon. Don't let Ellen's rejection of your offer come between you, Henry. It's a terrible blow. I know you and John both cared for her deeply, but think if she had accepted one and left the other to watch their happiness from the outside. No, to turn you both down was the kindest thing she could do. 
and you still have John and I and our beloved woods to console you. November 1840. Dear Sophia, I have never felt so badly in my life as the day I refused Henry's letter of proposal. But Father does not approve of his transcendental philosophies and instructed me to refuse in a short, explicit, and cold manner. It is all over now, and I hope that though I have dashed the hopes of both your brothers, we can still remain friends in the end. Ellen. Good afternoon, Henry. Hello. My friend Thoreau, I know that there has been much delay, but your article is this moment in type and will appear as the leading article in Graham's magazine for next month. I will see that Graham pays you fairly for it. Do not think hard of him. I am enclosing two dollars until such time as he does. I propose that if you will sit down and write another article for me, I will give you twelve dollars for it on delivery, publish it, and leave you the copyright. Do not write too long, or more quickly than you can think, for that will not work for the magazines. Yours, Horace Greeley. Ah, there you are, Henry. I think your sister was just in and collected a letter from your old friend Miss Sewell. We haven't seen her much recently.
This flute belonged to John, but it should be yours now. Won't you come play for us? On a lonely path past the railroad tracks, beyond sharp sounds of the ice cutter's axe, I wait for thee with care and patience in loving remembrance of dear acquaintance. Sophia. has not sometimes derived an inexpressible satisfaction from his food in which appetite had no share. I have been inspired through the palate that some berries which I had eaten on a hillside had fed my genius. He who distinguishes the true savor of his food can never be a glutton. He who does not cannot be otherwise. Winter has arrived and a regular snowstorm has commenced, fine flakes falling steadily and rapidly whitening all the landscape. In half an hour the russet earth is painted white even to the horizon. I know of no other so silent and sudden a change. The first ice is especially interesting and perfect, being hard, dark, and transparent. If you examine it closely the morning after it freezes, you find that the greater part of the bubbles, which at first appeared to be within it, are against its under surface, and that more are continually rising from the bottom. 
While the ice is as yet comparatively solid and dark, that is, you see the water through it. written word is the choicest of relics. It is something at once more intimate with us and more universal than any other work of art.
Fishermen, hunters, woodchoppers, and others, spending their lives in the fields and woods, in a peculiar sense a part of nature themselves, are often in a more favorable mood for observing her, in the intervals of their pursuits, than philosophers or poets even, who approach her with expectation. Thank you. 
Thank you.